Ladies and gentlemen, may I now kindly invite OGP, Civil Society Organization Lead Chair, to deliver his speech. Please welcome Mr. Rakesh Rajani. President Susilo Pambang Gudiono, ministers, civil society colleagues, friends. It is wonderful to be among you and thank you for this opportunity. At our welcoming dinner in Bali a few days ago, we witnessed a wonderful presentation of the Ramayana story of the epic battle between good and evil and intense struggle for power. The narrative is familiar to me because as a young boy growing up in my hometown of Mwanza, Tanzania, my grandmother used to tell me this story on many evenings. The details are etched clearly in my mind still and probably continue to influence, at least in part, how I see the world. In the Ramayana, what is good and what is evil is not ambiguous. But for many of us today, the challenges we face are less clear. The deeper challenge of our time is whether we live in societies that are more open or more closed, about the quality of space for citizens in the regimes in which we live. So what is open? How can we know that a government is open? I think you will agree with me that one of the most critical features of openness is responsiveness. And today I would like to speak with you about four features of that responsive government. First, an open government is a listening government. It is genuinely interested in people's thinking. It wants to know its concerns, needs, priorities of the people so that the government can respond. What matters more to people? Is it access to water? Or is it the quality of the roads? Or is it the bad treatment they receive at the hands of the medical staff? Or the fear they experience from the police? Or is it the freedom to live their lives and make personal choices without the government telling them that you can do this or you cannot do that? A listening government also knows that it doesn't have all the answers and that some of the best ideas to make life better will come from people. So it actively seeks and sets up practical mechanisms across different branches and levels of government to solicit ideas and suggestions. It listens to experts and it cares about evidence. It is a telling and I think rather unusual testament of the leadership in this country that President Yudhoyono has taken a personal interest, for example, in the work and research methods of the Joint Poverty Action Lab and taken and helped set up a unit of its own in this country. Or that Pa Kuntoro, who we just listened to, dealt with the enormous, daunting humanitarian challenge in the aftermath of the Aceh crisis by establishing a transparent platform to collect and share information about what is going on, who is doing what, where, so as to be able to, in a transparent way, coordinate and let people know what they are entitled to. Or that using social media, using Twitter and Facebook, the president of this country communicates with more than 5 million followers on Twitter and more than 2.5 million on Facebook and listens to what they have to say. In addition to informed ex experts, a listening government also asks for ideas from ordinary people and from civil society. Imagine for a moment the power of that. For an old fisherman or a bus driver or a cook or a teacher who has been used to having government telling him or her what to do, who is in fact a little scared of government to now experience government as truly interested in what he thinks 
or the suggestions she has to solve problems. Imagine what it does for the relationship between the state and the people. Indeed, what it does to public trust. Second, an open government informs and educates. It understands that it needs to explain to the public what is going on in the country, what the government is doing, and the basis of its policy and budget choices. When it is thoughtfully explaining the nature of trade-offs, such as why some services can be free and others not, or why hard decisions are being made, and both invites and informs public debate on those choices. It makes policies and data open. It opens data. In the United States, for example, after President Obama came into power, hundreds of thousands of data sets, which were previously closed, have been made open. The United Kingdom is exercising similar leadership in opening up data in partnership with groups like the Omedia Network, My Society, and others. It opens up budgets. The International Budget Partnership tracks the openness of budgets in over 100 countries, which show, for example, that countries like South Africa, despite the many challenges, governance challenges they have, are in fact a leader in budget transparency. An open government also realizes that there is not a straight line between policy and implementation, between the letters of the law and how they are translated by officials, between orders of a president and the reality on the ground. So it is particularly interested in monitoring practice. In India, for instance, Nikhil Day of the civil society group MKSS and his colleagues have invented a simple practice of painting, literally painting, public budgets on thousands of village walls so that people can know what the plans and budgets are and can follow them up and match them with reality. Using the country's right to information law through social audits, they involve hundreds of thousands of ordinary people across many different communities to follow up employment registers to see whether the workers listed there are real or ghost, whether the wages paid are real or fabricated, whether the budget execution reports show real progress or whether they show false buildings and services. And by doing so, they put public officials on notice to be accountable to the very people who elected them. Third, an open government engages with citizens. It doesn't just say, give us your ideas and then leave us alone to get on with things, just trust us. Rather, it involves people in the process of government. It co-governs. In relation, for example, to the work of MKSS in India that I just mentioned, the response from government overall has been mixed. There has been a lot of resistance and intimidation, but not everywhere. Some states in India have embraced this approach, as they have in Philippines, like we just heard, and adopted the practice at the heart of government. And these ideas are spreading across the world with many civil society organizations and governments taking them up. Similarly, the civil society organization that concerns citizens of Abra for good governance in the Philippines is also engaged in monitoring infrastructure projects. From the start, they have involved the government in this process. At the beginning, the engineers, the experts, were skeptical because the people who are monitoring were ordinary citizens and they said, what do they know about monitoring infrastructure? But the group persisted and now they have convinced the engineers and many people in government and these practices are now influencing policy changes in the government or, and it's particularly in relation to procurement. This practice of involving citizens can also be spread through broader policy making processes. The idea here is open policy making. The UK, for instance, had uh, used open policy making in devising its second open government plan. Which is, far, which is a far better product as a result than their first. And one could use this for general policy making throughout. In Mexico, the next incoming chair of the Open Government Partnership, which I was fortunate enough to visit in January, I was impressed to see 
a tripartite partnership between the executive and government, between its autonomous um, uh, information, uh, information commission and civil society, working together, each with its own independent views, but collaborating to create a better society. Fourth and finally, an open government is also a government that protects. It protects all people, but in particular, it protects those who are the least among us, those who have little power. And here I have two groups in mind. First, it's groups that are traditionally weaker in society or have had less power that have been disenfranchised or marginalized. Women make up half of our societies, but they do not enjoy half the power. Children in many of our societies make up more than half of our societies, children and young people, and yet their voices and their opinions are never heard. Schools are full of children, for instance, but no one asks them what they think or how the schools could be run better. Minorities are another group that deserve particular protection. And an open government does not only support and advocate for its majorities, but it particularly takes care to protect its minorities. Minorities who may be ethnic minorities, minorities who may be religious minorities, minorities because they are people with disabilities and other such groups. And it particularly protects those whose views and whose lifestyles are different from us. We may not necessarily appreciate and like what different people do, but the whole point is that they have a right to be protected. And the second group that comes to mind is an open government protects those who criticize it. The whistleblowers who will point out that there is corruption in government. The people who will say in public that they disagree with the policies of the president. They disagree with the pronouncements of the minister or they do not agree with the reports that have just been issued and they believe that it does not tell the truth. A truly open government will be known by the attention it gives and the care it takes to protect dissent and those voices in its own society. Mr. President, friends, in conclusion, I want to say that an open government is a learning and government. It takes risks. It tries out different things. It goes out of the box. It imagines new ways of governing. And throughout it is one that learns and changes that is better and more effective today than it was yesterday. So every member of the Open Government Partnership, every government indeed, every government leader, needs to be able to answer the question, what have you learned? What have I learned? What do you realize you are wrong about? What do you know now that you do not know before, that you did not know yesterday? What will you change and do differently as a result? And throughout, in doing this, remembering the most important metric for why we are all here, which is to ask, what difference is this making in the lives of ordinary people? How to do this is not easy. Changing the culture and practice of government is not easy. There are no blueprints or easy answers. It will take a lot of humility, curiosity, and courage. But with these three things, which are probably the most important qualities of open government, we can move forward. Thank you very much.